Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled Abigail and John, Portrait of a Marriage. And we're pleased to be joined by lead scholar Edith Gellis from Stanford University. Uh, today is April the 27th, 2021. My name is Andy Mink. I am the Vice President of Education at the Center. And on behalf of Mike and Libby and our graduate intern team, Hannah, Carly, and Josh, I want to welcome you back. Thank you for being here tonight. I also want to thank our co-sponsor tonight, the Grateful American Foundation. Uh, as I'll describe momentarily, uh, we've worked closely with the uh, Grateful American Foundation over the last couple of years to bring free and open resources, uh, instructional resources to teachers at all levels. And we're uh, just very uh, thrilled that David Bruce Smith uh, was was willing, is willing to uh, support the continued um, uh, integration and understanding of, of uh, people like John Adams in our curriculum. Um, I also want to thank uh, those who are joining us from around the country. Uh, it's always a pleasure to look out and see folks like John. John's with us here tonight from Barron Springs Middle School in Barron Springs, uh, Michigan. Uh, Hillary and Clarice are joining us from LA along with a few of their close friends. Uh, Amanda's here doing uh, some research after research. Amanda's doing her dissertation on uh, the three first, uh, three first first ladies. She's in Denton, Texas. Uh, great to see Teresa, as always, from Avery County here in North Carolina. And Adam, thank you so much for your help tonight. Adam's joining us from Princeton. He's also our resident help desk. Um, the National Humanities Center is uh, going through the end of our year feelings, just like all of you are in that academic rhythm that we uh, typically get. Uh, we've recently announced the 2021-22 uh, fellowship class. I'd encourage you to go to our website and introduce yourself to those uh, just excellent innovative scholars. We're also starting to wind down this year and it's been a year unlike any others. Um, you know, the disruptions of the pandemic, the ongoing uh, conversations that we are having around social justice and uh, the state of our communities, the uh, ways in which I think uh, all of our lives have been reimagined in some ways, whether it's working remotely or virtually like Laurie, who's driving home right now from her first hybrid teaching assignment um, or just parenting. It's really been uh, just an incredibly um, disruptive year. But I, I, I think at the center, and I think my own feelings see that as much, hopefully see that as much as opportunity as it is loss. Um, I, I personally get a, a little frustrated when I hear about things like learning loss in kids, because I know every single teacher I work with and know personally are working hard, and kids are learning a ton of things. What those things are, uh, maybe it may look a little different than they have in the past, but we at the center uh, are deeply appreciative of all the work that you do in your classrooms. And uh, I'm interested in the coming year to see how that will um, how, that, how that will translate back to whatever the new normal might look like. Uh, for us, that does include working with folks like the Grateful American Foundation. And one resource I'd like to draw your attention to is the uh, recently published book, Abigail and John, written by David Bruce Smith and illustrated by his mother, Clarice Smith. This is just a wonderful resource for you elementary school teachers in the room, and I see more than a handful of you. Um, and I think it's different than a lot of uh, uh, historical books or reading informational text at the early uh, elementary grades, because it does focus specifically on the partnership of Abigail and John, Abigail being uh, the first of in those, those names on purpose. And so it's less about sort of the founding fathers and that kind of iconic presidential history that sometimes we get sucked into and maybe more about the, the role of a partnership, of a marriage, of a couple, of a strong first lady, of the, of the ways in which they're able to shape and, and, um, and be a part of early America. I would encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, we've added a tab uh, for continued readings and uh, you can track it down and, and perhaps use it in your classroom and differentiate it by, uh, by grade level. I should also say that resources in support of tonight's webinar, as well as that book, uh, can be found in the Humanities in Class Digital Library. This uh, OER, Open Education Resource Platform, is free and open, so you can count on everything that you get there to be available for you to modify and to use in your teaching and your instruction. I would encourage you to join the webinar series group. That's where you'll find recordings of our sessions, resources, and PowerPoints we've put together, all the resources that we've curated for tonight's session. Um, you'll also find the, by the way, in the discussion tab, a sneak peek at next year's schedule if you're interested in how to plan your year uh, starting next September. 
Of course, it's not only the National Humanities Center that locates its resources in this digital library. It's also all the partners that we developed over the years, and that includes um, just wonderful humanities-based organizations like New York Historical Society or the American Antiquarian Society, as well as, um, as other organizations you might not be as familiar with, like the uh, White House Historical Association. Uh, go to the, uh, to the library, use your keywords to search for the resources that you find valuable, and then you can curate them in your own profile. I'm also uh, kind of in a bittersweet way uh, here to tell you that we have only got two more webinars left. We are truly in the ninth inning now. And 45 episodes later, we will be wrapping up uh, this year's uh, series next week. We've got two more coming up, one on Thursday night with Akram Khadr, past fellow at the center, uh, who will be leading a session on Arabs in America, A Brief History. And then we'll conclude our year with Nita Jankowicz, who will uh, share her work on countering disinformation in this era of conspiracies. I hope you can join us for one or both of those sessions. Finally, I wanna thank our Teacher Advisory Council for their ongoing work and contributions to uh, the program this year. I know Maureen Lamb, who's with us tonight, is uh, deeply interested in John Adams, and, um, and I know that uh, all of our Teacher Advisory Council members have contributed in, in some really meaningful ways this year. If you're interested in joining next year's cohort, our application will close on Monday, end of day. So I do encourage you to submit your application. We are always looking for a wide variety of educators from different backgrounds, different geographies, but all of whom have an interest in both contributing and being supported by the National Humanities Center very directly. I hope to see uh, all of you who are in our webinars on a regular basis uh, uh, perhaps uh, apply for that cohort. Finally, tonight, um, uh, this session, as you know, is an audio and PowerPoint only webinar, but your participation is deeply important. Please use the audience chat button to comment and um, share thoughts and resources and links. Use the Ask Professor Gellis tab to submit formal questions. And as the moderator, I'll bring them forward when the time seems right. Um, and if for some reason the Wi-Fi is spotty, you're not quite making out our voice, uh, I encourage you to either refresh your screen or worst case scenario, you can log back and come back in. I promise it will not disrupt your documentation of attendance. Again, you've joined us tonight for Abigail and John, Portrait of a Marriage. I'm thrilled to be joined by Edith Gellis, uh, Professor of History and Senior Scholar at Stanford University. I'm also pleased to welcome Lindsay Sharon uh, to tonight's episode as our TA. Lindsay is a teacher at Ensign Intermediate School in Newport Beach, California. Lindsay's gonna be dropping links of instructional resources and thoughts in the chat box, and she'll be here to support the conversation as well. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you, uh, Professor, to uh, tonight's webinar. I really do appreciate you joining us and sharing uh, your work. Can you hear me out there in Palo Alto? Professor, if you can hear me, then we'll unmute yourself in the presenter bridge. Is that it? There you go. That was okay. uh, that was quite that was an entrance. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I appreciate okay. you being patient, being added to the uh, to the to the uh, series. Um, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, and I want to make sure we have enough time for all the material you've prepared. Uh, but I wonder if I can start with a just a quick question for you, because I know in our conversations and in reading your book, it's clear that you have spent a lot of time in the archives. Ah. You're, you're an historian. You go to those archives with questions, things that you want to explore and find. But I suspect you may have come across something that just stopped you in your tracks. There was a wow moment. Can you think of what that uh, that document might have been? What what was that thing you found in the uh, in the archives that just blew your mind when you first found it? Wow. Well, what really blew my mind is that Abigail Adams wrote a letter to her husband John while she was in labor, and I think that is a really wow moment for me. Um, yeah. She would stop periodically in the course of that letter and say, now I must stop to bear what I cannot bear. There would be a pause in the letter. You could hear her voice saying, 
I'm in labor now, John. Excuse me for a minute while I endure this. And then she would return and write. I don't know of another letter like that anywhere yeah. in um, the literature that I've seen, uh, particularly of early America, um, that a, a woman wrote a letter to her husband while she was enduring labor. That, that's such a lovely example and, and powerful. And I, I asked you that question partly, too, because as a master storyteller, as a researcher, as a as someone familiar with the archives, and after the story you share with us tonight, I want our audience to also remember that you're also doing evidence-based work, that those documents, those archives must be critically important to the way you approach this field as an historian. And to have that, there's it's not just the thing, right, the two-dimensional document, but you've breathed life into it just in that short summary. Well, of course, yes. And I'm going to talk about the archives um, at the beginning of my talk. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that personal moment. Um, you know, I, I, I like sort of imagining you, hunt, you know, hunched over or with the documents in the archives and kind of having that little sparkle happen, that uh, magnesium strip of finding that. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. So, is it my turn? It is your turn. We are we are here, and again, as the moderator, I will bring questions to you on occasion. Uh, you can advance the slides at your own pace, and uh, we're anxious to hear about your work. All right. Um, I just have a question for you. I'm still not finding sure. my slides. I see myself. I see slide 15. Now, just I'm... click on 16 now. 16. There you go. There I go. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for that nice invitation uh, in introduction. And thank you also, Libby Taylor, for all of your arrangements. It's a pleasure to be here. I salute all of you in the audience, myself as well, in fact, for choosing to become teachers, members of what I like to call the noble profession. Teaching is a calling, it's a talent, it's a gift, and a privilege. For most of us, I think I can say, most of the time, maybe even 70% of the time, we can say, I love what I do. And because I'm teaching, te talking with speak teachers and scholars, I'd like to begin this session on the atoms by accounting for the nuts and bolts of what we work with the source material, in this particular case, the Adams Papers. When John Adams' grandsons, George and John, departed in 1807 to join their parents in England, he counseled them, quote, whatever you write, preserve. That admonition he had taken seriously in his own life as did his son John Quincy, even more seriously. Both kept diaries, letters, journals, records, diplomatic papers, bills, receipts, you name it, throughout their long careers. John Quincy Adams did so from the time he was 12 years old. It became a family hobby, nay, an obsession, to hoard their papers. They hauled, hauled them around the world in trunks and boxes, and over time, the massive collection of documents ended up at the family homestead in Quincy. What to do with them? When he wrote his will in 1819, John Adams turned over to his son, John Quincy, Not the right one. There it is. John Quincy, all my manuscript letter books and account books, letters, journals, and manuscript papers. John Quincy, in return, bequeathed to his son, Charles Francis Adams, quote, my library of books, my manuscript books and papers, and those of my father. John Quincy also further instructed that a fireproof building be constructed to house them. 
His bequest also allowed that the contents should be retained as, quote, one property to remain in the family, not to be sold or disposed of as long as may be practicable. This practice of collecting and preserving continued through the tenures of two presidents, three diplomats, numerous politicians, historians, novelists, businessmen, and as many wives, mothers, sisters, and in-laws through the generation of Charles Francis Sr.'s sons, Charles Francis Adams II, John Quincy Adams II, Henry Adams, and Brooks Adams. Over the years, the administration of this massive trove became both burdensome and contentious among the Adams descendants. For the first generation, it was housed at Peacefield, their home. Then Charles Francis Adams built a stone library, as his father had admonished him to do. And here's the stone library as it looks today, and you can see it's overgrown with ivy, and it's, uh, and it's uh, the landscaping is quite lovely now. But that's a very modern edition of it. But you can go and you can visit there. Here you see it in location to the original household. Um, and um, here it is, its interior. All of this is... Um, open to the public, and you can go and visit. The, the Adams manuscripts are no longer in the library, but this long table house holds large books which John Adams acquired, and there are many books um, pertaining to the area and portraits of the family. It's, it's just a lovely place to be. Um, finally, it was decided to send the papers, some of the papers, to, for safekeeping to the Massachusetts Historical Society, where many of you have maybe been, in Boston, where they would be secured from deterioration that happens to paper over time, especially in damp climates. For all of this time, the papers were closed to the public. Only on occasion were some scholars privileged to see or use them. The reasons were manifold. One was to prevent loss, theft, or destruction. Another was to preserve them intact from deterioration. But also, the family had become defensive about their reputation, and they resolved not to allow family skeletons to be subjected to public surveillance. Still, the maintenance of these papers was burdensome, and the family quarreled. Finally, in 1902, the Adams Papers Trust was created, and the papers were transferred to the, all of the papers were transferred to the Massachusetts Historical Society and declared closed to public scrutiny. Only family members had access or could permit access for 50 years. Another couple of generations passed until 1952, when the trustees met to assess the end of the trust period and the future disposition of the papers. Hallelujah! Ownership of the Adams Papers was transferred from the family to the Man Mass Historical Society, and they were opened to the public. The first step that was taken was the microfilming of the bequest. Over four generations of Adams family history, from John and Abigail Adams' time to 1889, an archive of almost four generations of public servants. It ran to 608 microfilms. Furthermore, the Mass Historical Society contracted with the Harvard University Press to print the papers in four series. The Working Papers of John Adams, The Papers of John Quincy Adams, The Papers of Charles Francis Adams, and The Family Papers. The Family Papers are where all of the letters among family members are kept. The first letterpress volumes of the 
Adam's Family Papers, were published in 1963, edited by Lyman Butterfield. And Lyman Butterfield wrote, Of its kind, the collection known as the Adams Papers is beyond price and without peer. No such assemblage of historic records touching on so many aspects of American life over so long a period has ever been created and kept together by any other family in this country. The history of practically every other collection of early statesmen's papers, important enough to bear comparison, makes a tragic contrast with that of the Adams Papers. Benjamin Franklin's papers were divided between two continents, largely lost, and then partly recovered from a stable in Pennsylvania, a tailor shop in London, and elsewhere. George Washington's carefully preserved official and personal archives were plundered by autograph hunters and carted about the country before an act of Congress purchased them from the heirs. Thomas Jefferson left his incomparably complete files to his family who contrived to keep them for some time. In 1848, Congress moved to purchase them from the heirs. The result was a bungling sorting process that went on for many years, and the bulk of the papers are now divided into two unequal shares between the Library of Congress and the Mass Historical, with small segments scattered among half a dozen repositories elsewhere in the United States. I have worked in the, I, Edie Gellis, have worked in the Adams Papers for many decades. To begin, I read microfilm for about 10 years, taking careful notes on multicolored three by five index cards. Pink for Abigail, blue for John, green for family members, and white for everything else. It was arduous, but when I was done, I felt that I owned the contents. The messages went from the film, through my hand, to my head, and then my heart. The Adamses became my friends, if not my family. Um, I'll pause here, Andy, in case um, there are questions. There are no questions yet, but I think, um, you know, I personally, I'm appreciating the way that you're laying out the, essentially a relationship, it sounds like you you started. you know, you're able to to really spend time in the intimacy of of the atoms. Um, from your perspective in doing doing that, uh, how how accessible was that story? Did you have to work hard to to pull it out, or did it did it flow from the the work that you had? Um, essentially, you're asking how I wrote about the Adamses after I read the letters. I, I, I think the, a, a teacher once told me that you read your sources until they sing to you. Right. And that is something you just one a a um, scholar just knows. You read until you know that there's something there, to, a story to tell, and you begin to tell the story. That, that's an instinct that uh, I think many of the teachers can also recognize. And I'm wondering if the story was, did it sing to you quickly? <laughs> did did they create, uh, did they write their letters imagining that others would read them? Or did you get a sense, sense that they truly were private and sort of removed from the fact that others would interpret them? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, and I've been asked this before. Um, these were private family letters that were written, and I think that when, and of course I wrote about Abigail Adams alone for many, many decades, and I, I, I've worked on Abigail for decades, and only with Abigail and John did I write about the marriage. Of course, John and the rest of the family appeared in her biography, but um, my focus has been um, on Abigail Adams for my whole career. And um, um, so I 
I don't know, just um I just wrote I when when Abigail's letters when there were stories that appeared, I told them. That was it. I, I understand. Thank you. Um we do have a couple other questions that are queuing up. I'm gonna ask one of them now. I'm gonna save the second from Jamie for a little bit later. Uh Lindsay, uh who again is joining us from Newport Beach, California, is wondering Who's if there, Lindsay. <laughs> it's, is there something about the letters that you think reveal about Abigail and John that's not often discussed about the couple? Uh, well, of course, they're more intimate. And of course, one gets a fuller story. Of course, the writing process is selective. So when I'm ready to write, there's a lot I leave out. Um, on Abigail and, Aunt and John book, uh, portrait of a Marriage, um, from which I've taken this talk, um, I cut one third of the book before it was published. So you always write much more than you, um, than, than, the, than the publisher is happy to have, I suppose, and, and one edits. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question? I there are a lot of stories that aren't told, and there are a lot of stories yet to tell. Right. Um, that that makes a lot of good sense. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to save the next couple of questions for a little bit later. Why don't you move forward with the story, and we'll start to hear more about uh, about what what was sung to you. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's very cute. Abigail and John were married for 54 years. For about Half that time they were separated, which accounts for the prodigious correspondence. The longest separation was for about 10 years between 1774 and 1784, when there were only a few times that they met. There was a complete lapse between 1779 and 1784. What has amazed me is that when they did get together after Abigail traveled to France in 1784, the marriage resumed with all of the commitment, caring, mutual interest, and passion of their early years. Abigail Adams was born in 1774 on November 22nd at her parents' home in Weymouth, Massachusetts. And you can visit this. It's a historic site now open to the public. And this was the original house, and you can see there's um, a farm and then the outlying buildings and now of course this whole area this is a 19, 1823 sketch that was made by a neighbor um, and this was the main house and the reverend Abigail's father had this L built um, to house his growing family her father was William Smith who was the first minister of the church in Weymouth for about half a century. No portrait survives of her mother, Elizabeth Quincy Smith. Her legacy was her maiden name, Quincy, of the distinguished landowning and political class. Abigail grew up in the Parsonage home, now under the management of the Abigail Adams Historic Society. She was educated at home by her parents and had the run of her father's vast library. She first met John Adams when she was 15 years old, when John accompanied his friend Richard Cranch to the Smith Parsonage while courting Abigail's older sister, Mary. Abigail was young, and John was at the time a law student and smitten with Abigail's cousin, Esther Quincy. John Adams was of a more modest background. His father was a farmer and cord wainer, that's a shoemaker. His mother, however, descended from a more distinguished lineage, the Boylston family of Boston. John, their eldest son, was destined to attend Harvard, which he did, graduating in 1775. He first taught school to support himself, and then he apprenticed to become a lawyer. By the time she was 19, Abigail and John were seriously courting. About a half dozen letters survived from their courtship years, mostly his to her, 
as she saved his correspondence. John by then had set up his law practice at home in neighboring Braintree. In 1764, they were married, and upon marriage, Abigail moved to the house that John had inherited from his father. Um, that I'm not fine. Oh, here it is. Yes. The house that John had inherited from his father when his father died. And it's called the Old House. And these two are now open to the public. And this is an early uh, print of what it may have looked at um, um, 100, 100, 200 years ago. Um, today, there's a shell station across the street and lots of buildings around. But this was the farm. And this was the house that John Adams and Abigail Adams lived in, um, called the Old House. And this was the house that John Adams' widowed mother, Susanna Adams, lived in. So Abigail lived for all those years, 75 feet away from her mother-in-law. And they got along very well, it turns out. And I've often asked why these two houses were so close together, but no one seems to know the answers. And the only thing we can think of is that they shared a well. I mean, given that there's so much space available here, they um, are only 75 feet apart, but they probably shared a well. The first decade of their marriage, 1764 to 1774, was the most normal period until their old age. And here we have very charming portraits of Abigail and John that were taken when they um, as marriage photographs, but it was actually a few years after they were married, and they were done by Benjamin Blythe, who was a self-taught local limner. Art hadn't progressed very much in the American colonies um, in the middle of the 18th century. This portrait of Abigail, I think, is especially beautiful. You see her very engaging face, her piercing eyes as she's looking, and she seems almost ready to talk. On the other hand, the body hardly fits the face. It's a, a rather large and, and clumsy, uh, clumsily done. Um, this uh, blue um, dress, I doubt that she owned it. It probably belonged to the um, artist. And I know she certainly wasn't, didn't own pearls at this time in her life. So the artist added all of those things. She got her first jewelry, her first pearls, when she, when John um, was the minister to the, to the court of St. James's and Abigail went to meet the king and queen, he thought she should own pearls. This picture of John is much less well rendered than the, the face, than Abigail's portrait. Um, the face hardly looks like the statesman that we think of as John Adams. And this, this periwig that he's wearing because he's a lawyer um, and it sets him aside as, as a professional man. And he's and the body is quite well rendered, but this doesn't look like a scholar, um, as a, a powerful statesman that he would become. Um, John's practice, law practice, began to thrive, and as a result, the Adamses moved back and forth to Boston several times, and it was during this time as well that Abigail gave birth five times to four surviving children. The first was a daughter named Nabby. And then there's John Quincy. And here is a very early and quite primitive uh, uh, sketch that was done of John Quincy when he was about 12 years old. And I'd like to think of this as a Picasso because the eyes are both facing front. It, it's, it's, his face is is actually folded forward um, in this, and it's much different from the later Copley portrait of John Quincy Adams that was made by when John uh, Quincy was the ambassador to the Netherlands, and he went over to London to visit some people, and uh, Copley was then living in London and did this portrait. One of the things I like to do when I look at the Adams pictures is to see whether they resemble Abigail or John. 
and having seen these earlier portraits of Abigail and John, uh, uh, maybe you'll agree with me that John looks, John Quincy seems to resemble his uh, mother. She was very pleased with this portrait. It's an exquisite portrait. And, um, and, and when Abigail received the portrait, she was so pleased and she said, someone told me that she, you look like me, she wrote to him at the, in the thank you note. And she was so pleased that um, um, that he sent her this very lovely gift. This is Charles Adams, the fourth son, who um, followed John Quincy. And it's the only existing picture of Charles Adams. And by the way, it's so frustrating that there aren't more depictions and uh, portraits of these people who lived in the 18th century. And we now who have an overabundance by taking pictures on our cell phones, on our iPhones all the time, um, can't imagine what it was like in an era when there's not even an extant photograph, an extant portrait of Abigail's mother. So anyway, this is the only extant photograph, a portrait of Charles Adams. And then there's the youngest child, um, Thomas Boylston Adams, and there is yet one other picture. I'll run through that again so that you'll see that there is the daughter, Abigail Jr. There is John Quincy, second child. There is Charles, third son, and Thomas Boylston, the second, the uh, fourth son. So um, and it was during this period as well, this first decade of the Adams marriage, that events leading to the Revolutionary War developed. Political tensions developed in parallel to their private lives. And I'll run through this quickly because I'm sure you know all of it. Probably no one would have predicted the future as Great Britain began to levy taxes that her colonies sometimes vigorously protested. Responding to the protests and reinforcing its prerogative to tax, the British government sent soldiers to maintain order in Boston. What next happened is known as the Boston Massacre, where British soldiers fired into a protesting mob that had gathered before the State House and where five men were killed, and a dog too. Um, John and um, the, the soldiers then were brought to trial, and John Adams agreed to represent the British soldiers as, a, as their um, lawyer. And the reason it was not a popular position to take, because people were quite hostile to the British, the Bostonians were quite hostile to the British at this point, particularly after this firing on a mob. Um, we know about mobs these days again, and I always like to point out that um, mobs are nothing new. They happened in history a lot, going all the way back to the protests against the revolution, against the British um, government in the colonies. So John agreed to defend the soldiers, and he did so successfully. They were all exonerated. Four of them, I believe, were branded on their thumbs as a punishment. Britain, nevertheless, continued to pass tax laws, including the Navigation Acts, most of which were withdrawn after protests with the exception of the tax on tea, and we know what happened to the tea that came to the Boston Harbor, came the famous Tea Party, and as a punishment, Britain passed the Declaratory Acts, including closing the Boston port. Relations between the mother country and her colonies had become grim. As a result of these tensions, Twelve of the 13 colonies agreed to meet and sent delegates to a provisional Congress now referred to as the First Continental Congress at Philadelphia. 
Um, it was one of the first times that the colonies had ever gotten together to unite about anything. They mostly saw themselves in relationship, each one separately with Great Britain. But now they saw that they had something in common, which was perhaps a protest to Britain against taxation. So the First Continental Congress met, and John was appointed as one of the four Massachusetts delegates to the Congress. He journeyed to Philadelphia, thinking of himself as a provincial and not knowing how he would be judged by the distinguished representatives from other colonies. But he soon discovered that he measured up, and he became one of the leaders in the Congress. Before the Congress disbanded after nine months, uh, they agreed to meet again in another couple of months. And so John returned to Braintree, but the respite at home would not last. He was soon reappointed by the government of Massachusetts to the meeting of the Second Continental Congress. Lexington and Concord occurred and the war commenced. With John's departure to the Congresses, the great torrent of correspondence between Abigail and John seriously begins. Prior to John's leaving for Philadelphia, letters survive but are sparse. Beginning with his long absences from home, their correspondence the epistolary dialogue by which they carried on their marriage commences. It would be a quarter of a century with some lapses that they lived apart. Abigail's letters during this period are the best record we have of the American Revolution and early national periods of our history written from the point of view of a woman. And this is because the Adamses saved, quote, every scrap they wrote. That's a Butterfield quote. Her letters mostly survive as receiver's copies because she rarely wrote drafts as did her husband. The custom then was to write a rough draft of a letter and then to copy a fair copy to be sent to the recipient. Abigail wrote late at night after her household was quiet by candlelight and using a quill pen. Her letters are a national treasure. And this is my edition of the Abigail Adams' letters for the um, library, done for the Library of America. And in it, there are 900 letters. Um, because of this project, I had to read through all of the letters that Abigail wrote over her lifetime. And I think I was the first person to count all of the letters that exist because many of them have not even been transcribed um, into print and they're still in their fair, their raw manuscript um, hand. Um, we counted about 2,400 letters written by Abigail during her lifetime. Sometimes letters surface, but mostly they've been kept together intact. And um, I was allowed to select nine, 900 of them, which was a very hard chore. So I read through all of them many times. And I like to say it was like going to the eye doctor and getting a uh, an examination when he says or she says to you, which is better, this one or that one? And you can't tell the difference of whether the large ABC or QBS says um, is, is more clear or not clear. That's the way it seemed to me it was, reading through her letters and having to select 900, which I did, however. And here is the book, which was published, I think, in 9, um, 2017. It was also during this time that... Abigail's friendship with Mercy Otis Warren flourished. Mercy was the other visible revolutionary woman. She was a generation older than Abigail and the mother of five sons. She met Abigail and John knew the Warrens, um, Mercy and her husband, James Warren, 
um, for many years when he traveled the circuit as a lawyer. Um, and um, he decided Abigail should meet Mercy because she was a very well-educated woman. She'd been educated along with her brothers in Latin, no less. Um, the Warrens were a wealthy family, and you can see the difference um, in Mercy's attire um, when you compare with the earlier picture that you saw of, um, of um, Abigail which was quite primitive compared to this photograph of this portrait of Mercy. Um, The dress is very, very beautiful. Um, It appears, and it's by John Singleton Copley. And this dress, it appears in many different Copley paintings. And sometimes it just has a little bit different um, lace trim. Uh, So that um, you realize that the the dress was probably owned by Copley himself. And you see Mercy as this um, very elegant woman. She's reaching for some nasturtiums, and there's a background showing the sky. And it's, it's quite an elegant painting. Anyway, Mercy wrote the first history of the American Revolution. It was published in 1805. Uh, she was quite an accomplished woman, and um, uh, but the and before the war, the family was quite prosperous. But like many other families in wartime, their fortunes reversed, and both the Adams and the the family lives um, suffered greatly. She one of the sons died, another one suffered loss of a leg in the military. Others were ill and died. Um, so that. Their, their story was one of decline over the revolution. And at the end of the revolution, the Warrens did not support the Constitution. They were opposed to the notion of a strong central government, and they supported the state's governments, um, the, that the independent states should be stronger than the central government, and which, as you know, after the war, that meant the division of the rival political parties Federalists and anti-federalists, and the Adams were federalists in favor of a strong central government. The Adams, the Warrens went the other way, um, and Mercy Warren further annoyed John Adams by effectively leaving him out of her story of this of the American Revolution in her history of the Revolution. He became very angry with her. And he wrote her a letter in which he said, alas, women should not write history. And that statement, which was recorded by him in a letter to Mercy Otis Warren at the end of the war, um, has been described as um, destroying John's reputation, that John's reputation has not outworn that statement that women can't write history, shouldn't write history, um, like cans tied to the tail of a car. This is a good image. Anyway, John left at home at the beginning of 1770. When he left home at the beginning of 1774, it was not predictable that he would be gone for so long a time. Indeed, he was gone for the duration. It was not predictable that the colonies would fight for independence, that they would indeed separate from Great Britain. And the Adams' marriage was transformed. Abigail became head of the family in her household. At home, she ran the farm, a burden that she abhorred, and eventually terminated by renting out the farm to tenants. In addition, She managed her household and cared for and educated her children. And while doing so, she educated herself as she began reading the books in John's vast library. In time, she became, for her era, an erudite woman, an autodidact, a self-educated person. She also became a businesswoman. She at first began selling gifts that John sent her from the cities where he resided. She negotiated land purchases, though she could not own the properties that she purchased. 
because women could not own property. They didn't even own the clothes on their backs until the 19th century. And of course, he was proud to learn when the Declaration of Independence was signed that John served on the five-man drafting committee. And you see here, John Adams, Robert Livingston, New York, Sherman of Connecticut, um, what's his name? Thomas Jefferson, oh yes, um, from Virginia, and Benjamin Franklin, um, the five-man drafting committee. Um, and Jefferson, of course, wrote the draft, and John Adams was the person who stood for it is said either two or four hours, no one knows, and persuaded the Continental Congress to adopt the Declaration of Independence. So he really deserves the um, credit, um, along with Jefferson, for the passage of the Declaration of Independence. Um, I wrote that if Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, John Adams gave it life. And it was gave it a voice, excuse me. And it was during this time also that Abigail wrote her famous letter to John, asking him, um, petitioning him for women's rights. And she knew he was on this committee, and she used her leverage to say to him in her famous, and, and you can see it here, You could, this letter, this is a, a, a copy of an original letter, and you can see how hard it is to read. Well, it's probably harder to read. Um, on your screens, but her famous statement is in the middle of a paragraph here. I long to hear, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. And it goes on. In 1777, Congress sent John Adams to Paris to help negotiate the French alliance. He took with him John Quincy. They returned in a year, and then just as quickly he was sent back again this time to negotiate the possible cessation of hostilities of England with England. And I must say, Abigail was very upset that he went not once, but twice to Europe. When he didn't get along in Paris with either Franklin or the French minister, John Adams took himself and his sons off to the Netherlands, where he negotiated the loans that allowed the American army to continue to fight. In the end, he returned to Paris, where he became one of the diplomats. And here you have a John um, Singleton Copley, Copley portrait of John as a diplomat. Contrast this with the photograph that you saw of the early sketch of John Adams as a young lawyer. Um, by this time, he is wearing a velvet coat. He's wearing a sword. Um, he's wearing a very neatly um, coiffed periwig. Um, he is featured with maps indicating that he's a diplomat, holding a diplomat and peace in the background. It's in to get altogether an august presentation of John, the diplomat. And he became one of the American delegates to sign the Treaty of Paris of 1783 that concluded the um, Revolutionary War. And here you have John Jay of New York. Um, this is John Adams. Hmm. Um, Benjamin Franklin and John Lorenz of South Carolina. And this is Benjamin Franklin's grandson who was the secretary to the legation, Benjamin Franklin Bash. But the portrait is unfinished by Benjamin West, the artist who did this, and it's at the Winterthur Library uh, in Delaware. 
The reason is that Oswald, the British delegate to signing the peace treaty, wouldn't sit for the portrait. The war ended and John didn't return. Abigail begged him to come home until finally she capitulated and made the ocean voyage to join him in Paris. It was at this point that their reunion took place with all the harmony that marked their original marriage. To our modern sensibilities, this is perhaps awesome. Of course, they could not divorce, but they could have separated, lived in different places, where the marriage could have gone cold. It didn't. It seems not to have missed a beat. The Adams marriage was an ageless love story. After a year in Paris, um, and this was the home to which Abigail moved in Paris, and they lived there for nine months, um, it had 40 rooms. Compare this with the little cottage that they lived in in Braintree. Um, Abigail's was said never to have been in some of the rooms, and it was badly heated, and she was cold a lot of the time. But it was a very um, beautiful house. With She loved the gardens. Her greatest dismay, however, was the fact that she had to have eight servants because in France, the system of service was that one servant would do one job only so that the person who scrubbed the floors would not help in the kitchen and the person who was in the kitchen would not make the beds and the person who made the beds would not work in the garden. And Abigail said she could have had two servants who would have done as much work as eight in America. Two Americans do as much work as eight in France. Um, after their year in Paris, the Adamses became, Ad John became the first American minister to the court of St. James's in Britain. And for Abigail, who had never traveled more than 30 miles from home, this sojourn in Europe was transformative. She became more worldly, more sophisticated, but she never became a convert. An observer of other, of other cultures, she only became a more patriotic American. And very many American women were going, um, and men were going to Europe and adopting European ways and pretending then that they were of an aristocracy. And um, many Americans went there for education, of course. But Abigail never became to a convert to um, a, and pre or preferred European culture. She was always first a citizen of New England, as was John. In 1778, the Adamses returned to a country that had just written a new constitution, and John Adams became vice president. And here we have the inauguration of George Washington as the first president of the United States. John Adams, because he was vice president, administered the oath. And this is um, at the um, National Building. It's in New York City um, on Wall Street, and the building is still there, and you can still go into it. Um, it's the federal building, and it's near Trinity Church and, and Wall Street. Um, the vice presidency was not John Adams' favorite experience. And the reason was he was supposed to preside over the Senate but not speak, and that pained John Adams, who wanted to enter the discussion. In fact, he would much rather have been on the floor of the Senate than as the presiding officer, but there he had to sit, and he did that for eight years, um, although Congress was not in session um, for an entire year at a time, sometimes only a couple of months. So he wrote to Abigail in December of 1793 that, quote, my country has, in its wisdom, contrived for me the most insignificant office that ever was the invention of man or his imagination conceived. Abigail, meanwhile, remained at home in Quincy for most of the vice presidency. And a lot of that had to do with, um, well, two things. 
Uh, one was her health was not good. Um, she suffered greatly from diseases that we can't even begin to diagnose these days. Um, but the second was the Adamses did not have a lot of money, and others of the founders were quite wealthy. And also, the President of the United States had a salary, earned a salary of $25,000 a year, and the Vice President earned $5,000. In 1796, John followed George Washington to the highest office. He would serve only one term. His presidency, as was most public service, underrated. He kept the country out of war. What went wrong had to do with the novel with had to do with the novelty of the passage to a second presidency. And it's well acknowledged that after the adoption of a new Congress constitution, and particularly in the case of George Washington, the first president is a natural. He's a hero. There was no question about who would be first president of the United States, but the commander in chief, George Washington, who sat a horse well. Um, the second president becomes contentious. And that's where the problems came. First of all, political parties emerged. As I mentioned before with the Warrens, the, some of the people favored stronger central government and some people, um, and that was the Federalist Party, and then the other party favored the states to be more powerful than the Senate. And they were then called the Democratic Republicans or the Anti-Federalists. So political parties that were not anticipated and certainly not anticipated by John Adams. He did not expect to deal with adversaries. Um, so political parties emerged, but also not knowing better and trusting them, John kept the cabinet members of George Washington. And it turned out most of those cabinet members were hostile to John, and they turned their allegiance to Alexander Hamilton, who wanted to subvert Adams' presidency, which he ultimately did. John was surrounded by enemies, not just from rival parties, but even from within his, noise, no, his own party. Nevertheless, he avoided war with either France or England. France and England were at war at that time, and both of them were attacking American um, merchant and naval vessels at sea. And John averted war with either France or England, a war which would have spelled, resulted in the end of the new nation. And during that time, his one great faithful ally was Abigail. She did not make policy, but she was a counselor and a companion and supportive of him in the loneliest job in the world. After one term, the Adamses returned home to Quincy. John never again traveled beyond Boston. Abigail made a few trips to visit her daughter in New York State. And here we have the wonderful Gilbert Stewart portraits of Abigail and John taken after 1800. And this one of Abigail, um, Gilbert Stewart began in 1800, and he did many sketches for it, but he didn't finish it and didn't finish it and didn't finish it. So John Quincy Adams started nagging him to finish, and it finally was completed in about 1815. One of the, it's a very beautiful portrait of Abigail, um, um, as only Gilbert Stewart could do. Uh, this dress that Abigail is wearing survives, and I've seen it. It's in a, it's packed away um, in the archives at the Adams National Historic Site in Quincy, and um, not the bodice part, but the the um, copper colored dress itself. And it was taken down for me to see. And one of the interesting things about it is you can see where the hem has been taken up or let out. 
because dresses at that time were handed down to other people. And so Abigail probably gave it to her granddaughters or to her nieces, and they were taller or shorter. And so the dress went through a number of generations, but it survives. And it's packed away in beautiful, large box with, uh, with packing paper around it to preserve it. The companion portrait to that is the John Adams. And John Adams loved sitting with Gilbert Stewart, and his portrait was finished more quickly. And the reason is they had wonderful conversations. And you can see John is almost ready to talk. He's, he's, he's in a conversation with the artist as his picture portrays. The Adams' retirement was marked by blessings as well as, as difficulties of monumental proportions. For 18 years, until Abigail died, however, they lived together as a couple, which they had not done since their early marriage. They had a parade of visitors. Their families came. Friends and guests dropped by. Strangers dropped by. People walking by and they were riding by in the neighborhood said, let's drop in on the Adamses. They'd like to shake the hand of the former president or first lady. Grandchildren lived with them. Their son, John Quincy, became appointed the American minister to Russia and then taking up the position that his father had had became the American minister to Great Britain. And John Adams resumed his correspondence during this period with Thomas Jefferson. Their friendship had broken during John's presidency. The Adamses had massive tribulations as well. Um, they lost their money in a um, bank failure in 183. But more important, their son Charles died at the age of 32 of alcoholism. Their daughter Nabby died at the age of 49 of breast cancer. Abigail's beloved sisters, who were her best friends, died. Abigail was often afflicted with debilitating illnesses, and she finally died in 1818. John wrote to a friend, I wanted to lie down beside her and die as well. John lived on, dying famously on July 4th, 1826. And the last words recorded supposedly were, Jefferson survives. Well, as you know, Jefferson died on the same day. Quite remarkable, the two patriots. So what do we conclude about from the Adams marriage? It was a marriage based on love. Um, I have spent some time thinking about what is love, and I go back to a teacher I had when I was in graduate school named John Patrick Diggins. And he, he taught American intellectual history. And John talked about love when he explored what is the meaning of love. He used the word generosity. And that's the word I can think about that perhaps best defines love, if you're going to define love. Secondly, there was parity in this marriage. Um, they were both very intelligent people, they had imagination, they had curiosity, and they needed and appreciated that those qualities in each other. They had religion in common. They were both believers, and religion played a very big role in their lives, um, as it did in 18th century lives. Um, they were liberal congregationalists. John eventually became what was what would have become Unitarian. And Abigail actually was, when she had trouble in her life, she reverted to a kind of very rigid Calvinism um, and um, believed that what happened on earth was negative. When negative things happened, it was punishment for something that um, people had done wrong. Um, she thought that um, 
the Battle of Bunker Hill was a punishment for the sin of slavery, for instance. She wrote that. They had values alike, derived from their religion, inherited, which was inherited from the Puritans. And I think of them, I wrote about, write of them as Latter-day Purans, Puritans. They were only two generations away from the um, Puritan strongholds in New England. And um, they kind of um, were marginal in the modern era as well, but I think of them as highly influenced by Puritan values. They knew the difference between good and bad, and they also had an ethos of service, duty, that one lived in order to do public service. And that is the theme that I've used in my book about um, Abigail and John, the concept of duty that they taught to their children as well. There was in this marriage as well a great deal of tolerance. They both grew and changed enormously over the course of their lives. Lots of us don't have the opportunity to be in a revolution so that our lives don't don't have that upheaval. Be interesting to know we're different people after this pandemic lockdown ends um, and how much that has changed us. But the Adamses lived in an era when both of them changed enormously. And they changed by living apart as well. But they accepted and appreciated the changes in each other. And finally, I think there was a component of playfulness in their marriage. They teased each other. And it was a way of communication that derailed anger. Um, If you put a light touch on a relationship... It opens communications, and that's the way they dealt with each other. They did all of this in a remarkable correspondence that has survived because of the original mandate from John Adams. Whatever you write, preserve. So that's what I have to say. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It really was mesmerizing. And as you spoke, some questions began to queue up, and I would like to take some time to respond to those and give you a chance to explore a couple of these points a little bit more fully. But thank you again for sharing not only your own work on this this topic, but really in some ways uh, introducing us to the time travel of going back and, and spending some time with the Adams as a couple. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about... Um, about the the historiography of Abigail and John, how, how has how have historians like yourself, how have people in the field, how how have we as a culture evolved in our understanding of the Adamses? Um, I'll take them separately. Okay. Um, the first, I'll talk to Abigail first. The first letters of Abigail were published. Um, in 1840 by her um, grandson, Charles Francis Adams. He published a small selection of her letters in 1840, and they were quickly became so popular that within 10 years, three more editions were published. So Abigail was known as, and perhaps best known, of all of the early American women. There weren't for, when I looked around for a topic to work on, women, when I very early discovered women's history and knew that I wanted to be a women's historian, there were not very, and I was trained as a an American colonialist, there weren't very many women to write about. There mm-hmm. was Bradstreet, the poet, I didn't do poetry, um, there was Mercy Otis Warren, and love her as I do, her writing is turgid, it's it's not very pleasant, <laughs> right there. Um, and then I found the letters of Abigail Adams. They've they've made her the pop, the publication of her letters has made her a public figure. No other first lady um, correspondence survives until modern times, uh, such as hers. Um, uh, Martha Washington's letters were destroyed. John uh, George Washington destroyed all of her letters. She was not very literate to begin with. And there are a few of them, just a very few of them. Um, Thomas Jefferson destroyed all of his wives for 
um, correspondence, his correspondence with her wife, his wife. So nothing is known about her. So that as you go through history, the papers of very few women survive like Abigail's. And as I said, uh, 2,400 letters survive of Abigail Adams, thanks to the Adams papers. So she was accessible and she was known about and very, very likable. Her letters are so, they're literature. She would have been a writer had she lived in a different age. And her genre, the let, the genre in which she wrote was letters and they tell stories. So um, Abigail has always been popular. John Adams, not so much. Mm. John Adams was criticized in his lifetime. And this is why the Adams papers, the Adamses were so defensive. They saw themselves. He was an outspoken man. Um, and John did not withhold his opinions. That's one of the reasons I really admire him. Unlike others who were very political, Jefferson, for instance, who hid behind a mask. No one really knows. No, ask any biographer of Jefferson. They don't really know about Jefferson. He was enigmatic. He hid himself. John Adams, you know. And also, Washington popularized himself. He arrives at the Continental Congress in his uniform. Um, what does that ask for? Um, John Adams wrote it all out. He kept a diary every day, and he was self-critical in pure, uh, the perfect Puritan form. Um, he wrote down all of the things that were wrong with himself. These eyes, this nose, this face. I am but an ordinary man. The times alone have given me fame. But he also criticized himself if he, because he was, self -con he was self conscious and he did criticize himself. He praised himself as well. But the fact that these letters have survived have opened him to criticism. And we all know that with public figures, journalists, biographers and so forth, what they go for is the sensational for what's wrong with them. Let's be critical. And John, um, who was a wonderful president, he kept us out of war. We don't praise people for keeping us out of war. We acknowledge those who wage war. But John Adams avoided a war that would have been destructive of the country. And he did it in a as hostile a political environment as existed at the time. Um, this was the outspoken vice president who didn't keep, and, and he, he also, the people were suspicious of him being a monarchist because he had spent the war years, so many years, 1774 to 1788, he was in Europe. And so people thought that he had become too European. Not the case. But he always was conservative. The very first books that he wrote or pamphlets that he wrote um, outlined a political stance that he kept for the rest of his life. Gordon Wood, the historian, has said John is the greatest political philosopher we've had in this country. And um, all of the positive things you can think about by John are outweighed by the fact that he suggested, for instance, when he was uh, the vice president um, and in charge of the Senate, um, the Senate was trying to figure out what to call the president. Uh, do you call him um, Mr. President? Do you call him um, Sir? Do you call him General? What kind of title do you call the president of the United States? And John Adams suggested your honor. And that just didn't go off in this democratic <laughs> environment. People thought he was being a monarchist. He wasn't. He was just trying to give dignity to the office. But what John Adams said publicly and wrote publicly very often backfired on him. Mm -hmm. So, um, John, so the paper, the first biographies of John were written by family members, and it wasn't until 1960. 1960, that a biography based on the papers, based on the Adams letters, which were then opened to the public after 1952, 1954, um, the first biography, um, two volumes by Paige Smith, were written. And this was, 
atypical um, political biography of John Adams. Abigail hardly appears in it. There's very little uh, personal family life. Um, it's a history of him and his times. And since then, there have been a number of biographies that are very sympathetic and very wonderful. Um, so does that answer that question? It, it does. Thank you. I've got several other questions uh, I'd like to bring to you. The first one, this is in some ways, it's a very similar, if not the same question from two different angles. The first is from Amanda. Amanda's joining us from Denton, Texas. And as I mentioned in my introduction, she's actually doing her dissertation on a very similar topic. And she cites your work as her primary uh, Abigail Adams resource. She's curious how you possibly managed to choose 900 letters and the ones that you chose for your book. How, how did you get it down to 900 and, and what made you settle on those? Um, well, I chose them painfully. And um, sometimes Abigail's letters, not all of Abigail's letters are masterpieces. Sometimes it would be very clear. Um, sometimes some of those letters are very, very short and um, don't, don't have much substance in them. Sometimes a letter of Abigail's, um, and, and sometimes they repeated each other. She would write a letter to her sisters that recapitulated something she'd already written to John. So that I, then I had to just figure out which expression I liked better. Um, and it was very personal. I must say, when I finished um, the job, um, it was sent to one of the editors of the Adams Papers. And one of the editors wrote back to me and said, I'd have chosen some different letters than you, but this is okay. <laughs> so, so it's a matter of taste, actually. Yeah. Um, some letters really pop out, like the Remember the Ladies lecture with letter, which is extraordinary, that letter of March 31st, 1776. And sometimes they were letters of condolence. I'm very sorry that uh, to know that uh, Dr. Rush has died. Uh, please accept the condolences of the Adams family. That was easy to leave out. Um, sometimes she was ordering materials. Uh, please send six rolls of calico or something like that and then that I, that I would leave out unless there were some cultural reason for including it uh but when the letters it it did by the time it got down to about 1200 letters it was pretty tough yeah and i just had to uh put a stake in the ground and, and choose one letter over another either because of the length or uh the, the choice of language appealed to me so that's, uh, that, that, that's fantastic. And a similar and follow-up question comes from Jamie. Uh, Jamie's joining us from Three Rivers Elementary School. And, you know, you've spent a lot of time with these letters. She's wondering if you have any recommendations of a letter that would be uh, meaningful and a good illustration of Abigail Adams for her second grade class. How about for young kids? Are there any letters that really stand out in your mind as as being uh, appropriate. I don't mean the language. I don't mean reading. And I mean sort of the substance of the letter that you would want a younger student to read. That's hard. Um, my first thought as you were reading the question was, well, clearly the letters to her children would be good letters. But then I'm thinking of the letter she wrote to John Quincy Adams when he went off to Europe. And in true Puritan form, Abigail wrote to him, behave yourself or um i would rather have you be um your i would rather your boat sunk and you landed at the bottom of the sea than and i'm <laughs> paraphrasing than you would be an ungracious child I mean, that's not a good letter to have your kids read i don't know that sounds, that sounds like a pretty appropriate one <laughs> That's, that's it. That's the letter you send to the father or the mother. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, uh, so, uh, it, that's a hard question for young people. Um, uh, I'll tell you what. Um, um, I would suggest the Remember the Ladies letter um, of March 31st, 1776, because it's very long and you can choose parts of it and then ask the children what they think. And meanwhile, if I think of something else, um, email me and I'll respond. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, 
here's a question, and in some ways, this might be uh, a great concluding question. Um, and this comes through uh, several people have mentioned this concept, and we've been talking about it in the chat box. But I'm wondering if you would agree with Lori. Lori is uh, joining us from Southern California. Would you say, Professor, that Abigail was really one of the first feminists or suffragists? Um, would not. Um, I would say she was. Um, she was the first woman among the first womanists. The word feminist didn't even come into the language until the end of the 19th century, um, and it was it came from the French feminism um, and um, translated into feminist. And don't speak of feminists accurately before the end of the 19th century. Um, it's very hard for us to understand Abigail's stance about women. She did believe, and I agree with her on this absolutely, that she was in a, what we call essentialist. That is, men and women are different. Um, and that goes against the claim that women are equal. So um, it, it's women are different. Um, and um, Abigail thought that they should be treated equally. That is, women should be an educator, educated the same way men. She was highly um, a, a, a great proponent of women's education, and she allowed her daughter to be educated. Um, she, her daughter was taught Latin along with the sons, and John wrote and said to the daughter, you can, take, you can study Latin, but don't tell anyone. And um, so she was a believer in education. She thought women should be well treated by men. She did not believe that women should take place to part in politics. She did not believe that women should have the vote. That comes much later. It's a century later, a half century later, I would say. It was too premature for that kind of thinking. But it was a time when she was thinking about women um Women should be treated before the law equally. Women should be well treated by men, but that women, in a true Puritan sense, were subordinate to men. So it's a complicated thing for us to think about. So when she says, remember the ladies, she goes on in her statement to say, be more generous and favorable than your ancestors. Don't put unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. And if particular care and attention is not placed, paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion. She, that was a joke. We're determined <laughs> to foment a rebellion. That's one of the ways in which she um, added a light touch to this serious demand of her husband. Uh, I think that I think that's a... Uh... Wonderful place to conclude tonight's session. That is with Abigail Adams' words from the letter. Professor uh, Edie Gellis, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your insights tonight. I do want to uh, make sure that everybody sees in the tab above the PowerPoint that we've got uh, recommended books uh, that does include your, your work, Abigail and John Porter, The Marriage, as well as the elementary school version, uh, I'm sorry, uh, publication by David Bruce Smith of the same title, Abigail and John. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed participating in this program. And I want to thank uh, everybody for attending tonight, uh, joining us uh, after a long day at, at school. Um, please do pay attention to the National Humanities Center social media and for upcoming opportunities and activities. Um, as I mentioned, we've only got a few more webinars left this year, two more, in fact. The next one is on Thursday night, April 29th. I hope you can join us. I hope you have a great day at school tomorrow. We'll see you next time at the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.